I first met Ken Krogh uh, when, uh, as we served together on the uh, executive council, executive board of the uh, VSA um, here, and uh, and then we actually had the opportunity of having breakfast together a few months ago, and uh, he expressed that he would be willing to come and speak. But Ken has one of the best stories that we have in the state of Utah with InsideSales.com. It completely disrupted in every way that you can think of the sales process for technology companies and has been um, recognized in any and every of the major national magazines and the Wall Street Journal and so forth that you've seen. So Ken founded InsideSales.com back in 2004. Think about 2004, you know, when all of the revolutionary companies such as Salesforce.com and others were beginning to uh, change the whole landscape of technology. So Ken was at the very uh, front end of that, and he currently leads the company as president and street chief strategy officer and working uh, together with his partner and, and the CEO. He sets the vision for the company, and he, bring to more to, uh, he brings more than 24 years of experience in sales, in business strategy and marketing in both domestic and international markets to sales acceleration technologies and consulting at InsideSales.com. He's received many industry awards, including being recognized among the top 25 most influential inside sales professionals consecutively from 2012 all the way to the present by the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals and has been honored as the number two in the world on a list of top social sales influencers featured on Forbes. But more than that, Ken is just a incredible human being, a family man, a person who loves his faith and is devoted to his faith. And I think that we have a real opportunity today, so I hope that you will uh, devote all of your energy and your thoughts to listening to Ken. And afterwards, we've ordered about 25 pizzas, so come on up and uh, join us in our Q&A, um, and uh, we'll uh, dig into some of the real meaty things. Please join me in welcoming Ken Krogh to the lecture series. All right, let's get me switched over here. While we're waiting for my slides to come up, I uh, didn't go to BYU, but the best course I ever took was right here from Dr. Chauncey Riddle many years ago. I went to the Naval Academy when I was 17 years old. I was the second youngest person there. And um, they were the only military academy that did not, there we go, I thought that one, good. They did not have a sabbatical program. So when I left, there was no guarantee I could get back in if I left on a mission. And so I met with L. Tom Perry and the military committee before we left to go back. And he said, well, as challenging as it is to get someone in the Naval Academy, why don't you just regard that as your mission unless the Lord says otherwise. And so for a long time, I thought that's what I'd do. And then the Lord said otherwise. So I left, resigned to serve a mission. And my class was the class that fought the Gulf War. My old roommate, Johnny Hayden, fired the first shot from the gunship that started the Gulf War. And I met this beautiful redhead named Sister Cornwall on our mission in South Carolina. And I it was willing to give up the Naval Academy after that. So I came back. And believe it or not, I finished at the University of Utah. Uh, but I got down here as fast as I could. So um, everything that I've applied in my business came from that one class from Dr. Chauncey Riddle. He taught me how to think. And what I've learned is that most of the time we go through school to get a degree so we can get a job. And entrepreneurs do not do that. Entrepreneurs, a hundred years ago, 90% of America were entrepreneurs. They were owners. They owned a farm, they owned a blacksmith shop, they owned a ranch. But now, a hundred years, some odd years later, only 10% are owners, and the rest of us are employees. And most of us go through school and we learn what to think. That's what an employee does. And when they get, uh, it used to be they get to age 65, now it's 69 or 70, then they'd retire. Now, a step above an employee is a professional. A professional focuses their knowledge into a profession. Doctor, lawyer, accountant, 
so on. And instead of learning what to think, they learn when to think. When it's a medical question, the doctor thinks. But then the entrepreneur, they take a very broad education, and they try all kinds of different things. And the key with an entrepreneur is they learn how to think. And my hobby is military strategy. I didn't realize it, but in studying Alexander the Great, did you know who his personal mentor was for three years? Anybody? Aristotle, who taught him to ask good questions, taught him how to think. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Innovation um, is how to think. Now, I've been doing this a long time. And um, people say overnight success. Well, no. We were joking earlier. It's been a long time coming. And um, I, get, I just came back late last night from Rome, where I spoke in front of Cisco's sale leadership. And so I have a bit of a jet lag problem going on here. So wake me up if I start nodding off here. Uh, as mentioned, I was recently ranked number two in the world for social selling. And I didn't even know I was being graded. Didn't know we were being looked at. And as we sat back and we wondered, what, what was it? In fact, the company was recently ranked number one of the top 500 growth companies in the United States, according to Deloitte. We had the highest social media impact, even ahead of folks like HubSpot and and uh, Marketo, and LinkedIn, and Twitter. Wow. And here's the reason why. We care about results. I come at it from the sales perspective. If social media doesn't actually sell something, it's done no good. No good in the world. So that's what I'm talking about today. I remember when I first went to work with Dave Elkington 10 years ago, I told him a story. It's the same story I'm going to tell you. When I got off my mission, my old buddy pulls up in a silver Porsche. And he says, you should come working with me. We should sell computers. There's these cool new things called laptop notebook computers. They're portable. Now, the, the, the laptop at the time was called a lunchbox. And you carried an old compact. And it was huge. And Toshiba just came out with these new notebook computers. And so I got so excited learning all about computers. I had a computer phobia uh, from the Naval Academy. They had an old uh, terminal mainframe. And part of our class was we had to type up our, how are you, by the way? Good to see you. <laughs> we had to type up our, our, our term paper. It had taken me three days to do it. And my buddy comes up behind me, and he says, uh, did you remember to save? And I said, save? What do you mean save? And there was actually on the terminal keyboard a button that actually said save. He said, it's right there. You've got to push save. So I was reaching to push the save button, and the screen went, and I lost it. And I vowed then and there I would never touch another computer. I paid my roommate to do my term papers. And um, I believe that one thing you have to do is face your fears. So when my buddy pulls up in a silver Porsche and he says, how about going into business with me? I said, OK, I'll do it. I'll face my fears head on. And I learned to sell computers. That was back in the day when a 40 megabyte hard drive, 40 megabytes, guys, was $350. And Windows 3.1 was the hot new thing. And uh, we were so excited. We didn't realize they had. Uh, stolen Apple's uh, GUI interface and got sued for it and all that. So those were the adventures. And um, I learned that if I um, understood technology better than the next person, I would sell more. So I decided to keep learning and learning and learning. I stayed up nights. I would, I would do a little bit extra. And I, I loved learning. Has anybody ever taken Strengths Finder 2.0 from Gallup? Raise your hand if you've taken that test. Okay, if you're not, I'd write it down. Strength, it costs you 10 bucks. Go out and take it. And it, what it will do is it will tell you your top five strengths out of 35 profiles. My number one strength was learning. So I've learned that when I get down, when I have a problem, if I just go learn about it, everything seems to solve itself. So I'm constantly, constantly learning. Uh, one of my five was achievement. One of my five was strategic. One of mine was connected. I have a way of connecting people together. So. Play to your strengths. The gospel helps us overcome our weaknesses. But in business, one of the key strategies is play to your strengths. So I'd recommend that you do that. So I spent three weeks with this cool new, I even came up with this cool name, Portable Systems. And I had this cool logo with this laptop computer and a handle. And um, I spent three weeks just designing my business cards. And I never sold a dang thing. So that's rule number one. Results matter. Results matter. I told Dave that story, and I said, Dave, we will not 
get business cards till we sold a million dollars. And that's the actual true story. We did not even print business cards because they don't matter. Collateral doesn't matter. All that matters is did you sell something? Now, I didn't think of that at the time, but you've got to execute your plan and make things uh, happen. So years ago, I uh, was, in fact, I used to, I was the marketing director for Paul Allen at Infobasis, the first big company that he built that got sold to Bookcraft and then uh, a Deseret Book. And then he went on to start Ancestry and My Family and Family Link, and uh, he started a lot of businesses. <laughs> well, I left that company after uh, learning how to do inside sales, and I was invited by Franklin to come in and interview Franklin Quest. This was before they merged with Stephen Covey's organization. And I boasted in a weaker moment that I believed using technology, because I knew they didn't have technology there, that using technology, I could take kids right out of college, put them on the phone, leverage them with the computer, and sell more than their $300,000 salespeople. So they took me up on that opportunity, and we did. We actually beat their six-month track record of new salespeople by 127% selling that book right there. We were the second fastest growing company. Does anybody even use the Franklin Day Planner? One, thank you, thank you. Now, 10 years ago, everyone in the room would have. You remember those days, right? <laughs> um, nowadays, they break it up into Evernote and Outlook and Asana and all these different apps. There's about five different apps to do what the Franklin Day Planner used to could do. I've never been more productive than when I used that little leather book. But I remember my job was to sell over the phone with kids right out of college. And we were cold calling, and we were not doing very well. One day I was walking down the hallway, and the receptionist was in the middle of the junction points between the two buildings at a desk typing away. And she had a stack of, of what looked like postcards. And my job was to sell the time management seminars. We were cold calling. I looked down as I walked by, and on the top of the stack, <coughs> it said, are you interested in a time management seminar? Check. I said, where did you get that? I've been cold calling. There's a stack of cards of people who say I'm interested in a time management seminar. That's what I'm selling. Give me those cards. <coughs> I took them and ran back to my salesperson, and he started calling, and out of 125, he closed 25 sales. I went back to her and I said, where did you get those cards? And she said, well, they're inserted inside of every single Franklin Day Planner refill. I said, how many is that? She said, well, we sell about three million a quarter. <laughs> what do you do with them? Well, we type in their address, we send them a catalog, then I throw them away. Oh my gosh. So I grabbed that stack and from then on, we learned this critical rule about business. It may be the single most powerful rule of marketing, it's all about the leads. Now, a lead has need. A lead comes to you having raised their hand and says, I need what you have. In fact, if you will learn that, I believe all of marketing exists for leads. I'm not a fan of branding. I think branding only exists so that leads close better. I'll just be straight up honest with you. If marketing doesn't generate a lead, that helps the sales teams close the business, it has no value. Now, you've probably seen our cheetahs on the side of the road and all that kind of stuff. We're hiring lots of people, but do you know those billboards actually cause leads that, that cause sales, or we wouldn't do it? We, we bought 500 taxi tops down in San Francisco. Scott was just mentioning he's seen our billboards at each of the main feeder airports with our cheetah talking about selling more, accelerating sales. We've actually tested every one of those and they drive up leads, they drive up sales, or we wouldn't do it. So the single most powerful skill set in business, in my opinion, is a four letter word that starts with a T and ends with a T. It's pronounced test. That is the magic. So we believe, uh, there's a great book by Jim Collins, it's not the book Good to Great, it's the next one he wrote. Great by choice, I believe, where he talks about a business becoming great during hard times. And he uses the example, shoot bullets, then cannonballs. What does that mean? Well, bullets aren't very expensive. Cannonballs are really expensive. 
Test by shooting bullets till it works. Then shoot cannibals, throw everything you got at it. That's what we do with everything in our business, is we test, test, test. When it works, we throw the kitchen sink at it and just keep going. We spend almost $200,000 a month on Google because Google works. Every vendor comes to us really frustrated at first because we said, well, we'll only give you a ch shot to be tested. If you're willing to be tested and you work, we'll be your best customer. If you don't work, we won't be your customer. It's up to you. So leads and test, critical. Now, I, I write a weekly column for Forbes magazine when I can get to it. It's no longer weekly. It's about every three weeks. Uh, I just got back, I said, from Rome, and I spent the plane flight home 17 hours writing another Forbes article. So it'll be a lot of fun. But I wrote an article that you might want to read. It's called Business is Like a Tree. I'm not sure if that's the exact title. But the concept is a tree sends down roots in many directions. And finally, one of them taps water. And it becomes the tap root. Then the tree stops growing its roots. Instead, it focuses its, its trunk, and it grows straight up. If it starts branching out too soon, it becomes a bush. It's not a tree. So it focuses everything it's got. Once it has a single tap root, until it gets higher than all the other trees, then it expands the branches again and diversifies in case it loses the tap root. That's another metaphor for business. Test all kinds of things until you find one thing that works really well, then stop testing and focus everything you got on success. Grow as fast as you can, then diversify when you're bigger than the other trees in the forest. Does that make sense? So I love this, this saying. We, we love to follow this guy, Mark Benioff. He's, they're our favorite partner. I can't say that all the time now because we're looking to perhaps partner with Microsoft here soon too. But um, Mark Benioff has been ranked top innovator, his business number one innovation company in, in the world for the last several years on, by Forbes. And what they've learned is that innovation is taking it some, something that works somewhere else and applying it in your world. That's all it is. I call it creative plagiarism. Find a model that's working somewhere else and apply it in your world. Don't test everything from scratch. Try and find a pattern that's already working and go from there. So we saw all kinds of revolutions happening. And we felt that there was a sales revolution that was coming, a new way of selling, selling remotely. This person with the attitude there is an inside sales rep versus the outside way of carrying a bag and going door to door. Uh, that's a model from the 50s. Although I have to say that inside sales is not telemarketing. We'll get to that in a minute. Telemarketing came as a result of using the phone, but inside sales came as a result of using the phone and the internet together. Web conferencing where you could project what's on your desktop to someone else is what, is what facilitated inside sales. So the innovation came along these lines. If you'll remember, anybody heard of Eli Whitney? Eli Whitney, what, what did he do? Cotton gin, what else? Probably steamboat, one other thing. Say it again. Interchangeable gun parts probably helped win the Civil War. Prior to that, a gun, the entire gun was made by hand by a craftsman. And if the trigger assembly broke, he sent the whole gun back. But Eli Whitney figured out if you could just take off the trigger assembly and put a new one, you could keep on going. So right after that, Henry Ford with the assembly line and then robotics and artificial intelligence. This is basically what we've done in business in the world of selling. We followed the exact same innovation model where we, we broke it up into small pieces. We put it on an assembly line, and we had specialists. I'll show you that in a minute. We now use robotics, and we've partnered with the machine learning labs here at BYU to use artificial intelligence so we can actually tell salespeople who they should call that would have the best chance of doing business with them. That's really what we've done. But it was just following the old manufacturing revolution of building a car. In fact, we used this exact model when we were thinking it through. And now today, it's a lot like this. We actually pictured Tony Stark. Now, he's a normal human being. Of course, he's a billionaire. So I guess that part's not normal. <laughs> but he's encased in technology. He's got a heads-up display. He's faster. He's stronger. He's more powerful. 
He can see and understand what he should be doing. He's prompted by technology. But it's a normal human being inside. That was also innovation. We just said, hey, let's just follow that model. And then we noticed how really cool things were manufactured. One person got really good at putting on the chain and putting on the, uh, uh, the muffler and, and, the, and the shocks. And, and so the normal sales process up to this point was one person sold the whole process. They found the lead, they closed the lead, they serviced the lead. That's called a generalist. Now, you can't be good at all those things. You can be fair, but you can't be great at any of them if you have to do all of them. So we broke them up into specialization, and that was probably one of the main innovation points that we special. The person at the top is an entrepreneur, or one who runs the whole business by themselves. The first thing they do is they split off the salespeople from the support people. Then they split off appointment setters from closers. Then they split, you see how it just keeps sp splitting like a cell in mitosis? We even, in the sales process, we even have lead researchers now who don't even get on the phone. They just find good leads in the data to give the people who are good on the phones. And that's where everything has really kicked in in our world, is we just used innovation. So it's been fun to see the old way starting to die, the death of a salesperson. And I wrote this article, What is Inside Sales? It went viral. I've had 200 and, well, 212,000 read this one and about another 100-something thousand on my own blog. And this little article basically says, inside sales is professional sales done remotely. Or inside sales is remote sales. And that's what sort of took off and realized we're not telemarketing, we're not customer service that happens to close something, but it's professional salespeople who sell remotely. Now that plays really, really well to you. Did you know there's now 112 universities with a degree in sales? 10 years ago, there was one. Five years ago, there was 70. It's now starting to really pick up. Because the millennial generations, they said, wait, I can make a lot of money and still not have to go out on the road and have a life? And that's what inside sales has really uh, been part of. Um, but you have to be the right kind of person. You have to be hungry. Now, I hope I've got video. Can I play a little video? This Selling someone, and they asked me, would you repeat that again? I was interested in going into broadcasting. I'm a doctor. And that was my key out. I wanted to make my mama proud of me. I was, a pro I was very much appreciative of what she had done for my brother and sister and I. And that was my way out. And I went over to a radio station. That's the guy that and told me that I was interested in broadcasting. He looked at me in my straw hat and my overalls. He said, you have any broadcasting? Back right I said, no, sir, I don't. What do you do? I cut grass. <laughs> Young lady, after what kind of work I do when I was working with a guy in the car, I said, well, I'm a sanitary technician. <laughs> he said, we don't have any job for you. I decided that that was something that I was going to do. I decided I'm unstoppable. I'm going to go up again. I'm going to do this. I started going to the radio station every day, developing a relationship with the people that were doing what I wanted to do. And that's what I encourage you to do. Where, whatever area you want to go and find people that are doing it the way you want to do it and develop a relationship with them. When I decided to come from this area, I wrote letters to Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, to Zig Ziglar, to Dennis Whitley, all the giants in this area. And I said, this is something I want to do. I've been following your career. Would you help me? Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, that's his mother, did an article on me, wrote about me in the most recent book that he issued, and done many broadcasts about me. I wanted to develop a relationship and rapport with those people that were achieving those things that I wanted to achieve. By the same token, I would go to the radio station, and I developed a relationship with the guys. And they used me as an errand boy. They needed some food or someone to go pick up entertainers that came into town. Temptation singing, my girl, Jerry Bubba singing, for your precious love, Sam Cooke singing, God will be singing. I would pick up the entertainers at the airport and drive them around in the disc jockey, big Cadillac. Didn't have any driver's license, but I'd like to have a hand, so. <laughs> Every day I used to go home and work on my communication skills, developing myself. It was when you know, he said, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. Start working and developing yourself out and prepare yourself for what it is that you want because you expect to get it. And when the disc jockeys were in the control room, I would go in and watch them and develop their trust level and they would let me stay and I would watch and observe them working the controls. When you want something out of life, don't worry about how you're going to get it. How is none of your business. The most difficult thing there is is to hold it's the whole of the vision. So there I was at the radio station. A guy 
I've had criticism from him. He's learning his word. I said, I know. <laughs> Can you work through trolls? Is there one of the other this guy is coming? Will you call him? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I hung the floor up. I said, now you must be thinking I'm crazy. <laughs> I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra, said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn up the radio. I'm about to come on the air. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> you know, it really is. How bad do you want it? A person's heart is the measure of the results that they obtain, typically. Now, a lot of people uh, pull me aside and say, well, what else do I need to be good at inside sales? A lot of women pull me aside and say, you know, we seem to do pretty good here. And I say, yep, you do. Out of the first, out of the top 10 consultants that I met 10 years ago, eight of them were women. When I was at Franklin, we measured what ingredients were key in successful salespeople. And we found four in one study, might, might be interesting to write these down. Now this was here in Utah. The number one ingredient, statistically, for a career in sales was a background in competitive athletics. It didn't even have to be in athletics. We had a, a competitive chess player that kicked, always did their numbers. Number two was return missionaries. Of course, you get a lot of knocking doors. Number three, Eagle Scout. Number four was a background in technology, specifically Microsoft Office, those four. But then we studied women in sales, and we found this is true. The average woman is worth 1.4 men. Sorry, guys. Now, it's interesting. Women don't seem to care to be number one. We, we hardly ever found them in the top 10%, but we never found them in the bottom 50%. So there's a lot to be said. Now remember the definition of inside sales, it's professional sales done remotely. This is Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce.com. Guess where he started his career? At Oracle as an inside sales rep on the phones. Now everybody up really fast. Stretch, come on everybody. I saw a few yawns in the audience. I just said stand up, come on now. Fluff your pillows, reach to the sky. Now I'm gonna point you the yawn monitor, okay? If you see a single yawn, you can make them do the same thing that way. If they're yawning, it's their fault. It's your fault, not mine. <laughs> All right? Okay, back down. Thanks, everybody. So Mark Benioff, founder of Salesforce.com, started as an inside sales rep. Salesforce.com did not have a door-to-door -door sales team for the first six years. Everything they did was over the phone and through the web. Remember, inside sales is the combination of the phone and WebEx or GoToMeeting, the ability to project what's on your desktop remotely. They, they still open up new continents with inside sales first. Now we found that the millennials are really taking things over and most millennials grew up, grew up playing World of Warcraft and Mario Kart. They can text on their phone behind their back. My, my son can text inside his pocket with his thumb. I've seen him do it. <laughs> and uh, the millennials are a whole new breed and this world of inside sales and social media really plays to their strengths. We did a research study right out after the crash. It was interesting. Our company had been profitable for the first eight years. We did not take money until we didn't need it. That was one of our core 
rules we made with each other, Dave and I. In fact, you might want to write that one down. Don't take money till you don't need it. It's a lot like Hyundai. They put out their 100,000 mile warranty before they were ready. It forced them to get ready. Put yourself in a position where you force yourself to execute and do a great job. Money is a counterfeit to success. You just throw money at it. You haven't built operational excellence. You've just thrown money at it. So build the operational excellence, then throw money at it. We're one of the few uh, founding teams that are, is still in full control of our company four rounds later. We've raised one, 140, mil, 140 million, and Dave and I still control the company because we decided to build a company that didn't need to take money. Now, of course, when you take money, you can throw gas on the fire. Our strategy was this, five year cycles. First year, you might want to write this down, product. Second year, support. Third year, sales. Fourth year, marketing. Fifth year, PR. Then we just do that over in a cycle again. Start with product, build your support, build your sales team, learn how to market, then throw PR like gas on the fire and the whole thing lights up. If you throw the PR gas on the fire too early and there's no logs burning, it just goes poof and disappears. That strategy has served us really well. Well, right after the crash of 2008, we got a call from our banker who said, uh, we're gonna have to take your uh, credit line away. Now we were throwing all the money back in, so we were profitably, but just barely. And without warning, we got our $150,000 credit line taken away and we had to figure out how do we do this? And our management team said, you know what? We're not gonna let this die. So we all decided to go without pay for a little while. And then all of a sudden we started to grow. In the worst economy of our lifetime, we started to grow. And I called up a few of our new customers and said, in case you didn't understand, there's a pretty major recession going on here. Did you just choose not to participate? <laughs> and they said, well, it's really easy. We stood back and we analyzed the areas of our company that were doing well and it was inside sales, so we laid off our outside sales teams, cut back, and hired more inside teams and your technology, and we took off. So it's a really good thing to be a counter-recessionary kind of company. The worse things got, the better we did. And the industry grew 15 times faster than the traditional sales model right after the crash. Even today, we're still growing 300% faster than the old school of sales, and we now have more salespeople in inside than outside. Now, I hate to tell you this, and I, I was joking with Scott earlier, we try and tell your, your marketing department this, that advertising is dead. And the real reason is that company right there, Google. Can you see the red right here? This is Google. The light blue is newspaper, the dark blue is magazines. Google now is larger than all magazines and newspapers. And it's leaving them behind. Online digital marketing allows you to immediately capture your result. <coughs> Advertising, you just pray that it works. You pay and pray is what we always say. But Google allows you to test. Remember the four letter word starts with a T, ends with a T? It lets you test what works and what doesn't and you stop doing what doesn't. Simple solution. That's why everything has changed right there. As you can see from right here, this is newspaper advertising revenue. Do you see how it just completely died? It doesn't exist, you guys. The world has changed. And it's all about the math and the numbers now and testing. So I've got one more little clip. Can we turn it back on again? See if this will work. Uh-oh. Okay, same problem. I know how to fix it. Maybe. Dang, sorry, you guys. This one's so cool, though, you got to see it. Thank you. 
in order to buy women, you need to buy love. Right. How do you see that man? First job in Big Bomb. That's first job. Anyway. Who's seen that movie? You know, that's the story of the 2002 Oakland A's. And Billy Bean, the general manager, was played by Brad Pitt, as you know. Um, this is the real guy right here. We just hired him to speak at our conference. He was $40,000 for 40 minutes. <laughs> and um, now they say he's doubled his price, and that was only a year ago. He may be the single most valuable person in any professional sport anywhere in the world. They say he's brought over a billion dollars of value. And all he basically did was l use math in sports. Now, in 2002, when they first used this approach, they only had... Um, about $51 million of budget, and they had to go up against Los Angeles and New York with 250, 275 million, Brooklyn. And they did it, and they had 20 straight wins. That had never been done in four decades. Something amazing happened that year. You saw in the movie where he asked, you know, what's the key? Uh, they, the key was they bought players that could do one main thing get on base. They could do crappy at everything else, but if they got on base, they, they learned that they would win. Now, the year that they did that, he shared with us, in fact, he said there can be no press in the room, and you can't share anything I tell you, uh, n none of the slides. So the slides I'm going to show you came from the Internet, not from what he shared. But he said that the year that they started that, in 2002, the statistic of getting on base was the eighth highest paid trait for a player. Two years later, it was number one, because the other teams figured out what they were doing. So they had to keep learning and evolving. They had to learn how to recruit players better than anybody else. The average major league baseball team recruits 100 players a year, and they start in the, in the farm leagues and work their way up. Every year, they, they raise five up to the major leagues. His team raises 13. They're so good at recruiting, that's 2.6 times higher shot of figuring out a diamond in the rough. And then what they usually do is they, like a great pitcher that they think is an $8 million pitcher, they hire them for $350,000. They keep their contract for two to three years. Then they intentionally trade them before they're worth $8 million. Why would they do that? Because it siphons off the budget of the other team who pay for it. And then they just go do it again. He says, we're in the business of baseball. It's a whole new approach. And he laughed because... This is him, first round draft pick. He said, my statistics would not have picked me. 
because I looked the part, I was 6'4", 200 pounds, but I did not have the statistics of this guy right here, 5'10", 160 pounds, World Series champion, silver slugger, Len Dykstra. He said, but our statistics would have found him. We did not find me. And the world of professional sports was changed forever. This is the Oakland A's payroll compared to the Yankees and the, and, and the Dodgers. And, and, um, but look at this. This is their win record, two years in a row, number one in the league. That's pretty cool, you guys, because they test everything. When someone asks me a question, I usually say this, well, I don't know, but I know how to find out. And that's the real answer to business today, to being an entrepreneur. But you don't have to test everything. It's better to let someone else figure out the hard stuff. So my next rule, people ask me, what should I do if I'm going to go out on, in, in business? I say, learn on someone else's dime. Remember Les, he said, go hang out with people you want to become. I did the same thing he did. When I was at the Naval Academy, I, I, I listened to a set of tapes by Dennis Waitley, who had also gone to the Naval Academy. He was the top speaker of his day. I decided to write him a letter. I wrote him a letter from the Naval Academy, 17 and a half years old. He wrote me back a four-page letter. I still have it today. I sat at the feet of Stephen R. Covey and Hiram Smith and several of the top speakers of the world so that I could learn what I wanted to learn. And then I went out on my own. So my best recommendation is to learn on someone else's dime. Learn how to test. Find a model that works. Now, this was a research study done by Business to Community on businesses that have hyper growth. The red is high growth. And this shows that 62.5% of, of, of the marketing they use comes from online versus only 12% of average growth companies. In other words, web-based leads is the key to hyper growth. And you can see the growth rate differential between high growth and whatever is 15 times higher. So you don't need to uh, reinvent that wheel. You've already got it figured out. Um, Time-wise, about there. OK, so let me, just, let me just end with this last little cool thing here. And um, then we can take some questions and answers upstairs. So I wanted to just end with this little challenge. Right now, this is a project. We have, we have a thing called the uh, Do Good Foundation. And we take 1% of our revenue, 1% of our labor, and 1% of our time every year, and we donate it to a cause. Last year, we donated it to the Boy Scouts of America here at Utah National Parks Council. And we also help them pull together a social media certification. And it was not just for kids, so it's not just a merit badge. It's for youth and adults as well. And you can actually, if you're interested, go take it at utahscouts.org. And I shared these basic principles with my son Josh and with some of our own employees. My son Josh went out and started an Instagram account that now has 12,000 followers into his old mission area of Russia. In fact, he has 6,500 Russians following him. And the name of his account is Tolstoy Fan because he found that was a bridge between what he loved, Tolstoy in Russia, and what they loved. And now um, Randall Ridd of the General Men's Presidency thinks my son Josh might be the single most connected per American into Russia. And he learned the basic skills that we walked through in that social media certification, which you can go get on utahscouts.org. So I don't have a lot of time to go into it right now, but I do want to recommend that digital and social media are the leverage points of today. And if you truly want to be an entrepreneur, there's, a, there's one more article I recommend, recommend called What is an Entrepreneur out on, on Forbes that I wrote that might walk you through some of the things there. Um, did I do OK today so far? At least keep you all awake. <laughs> <laughs>